Guys, welcome back to the MB Medic Podcast. It's once again me, your host, the sexy, the handsome, the competent in every way, the intelligent MD Medic. Today, I'm going to tell you how you, like me, can get into med school and become an MD without a bachelor's degree. That's right, an MD without a bachelor's degree. It's very, very possible, and I can tell you this because I did it. Now, a little bit of a disclaimer. I did not apply to any DO schools. I did not enter the osteopathic medical school application cycle. Osteopathic medical schools are fantastic options, and quite frankly, it's probably more feasible to get into a DO school without a bachelor's degree than it is to get into an MD school. But I can only speak from my experience of getting into an American allopathic medical school without a bachelor's degree. I can only speak from what I've done, and because of what I've done, I'm going to teach you how to do the same. So here's a little bit about me. Here's my story. So I went to high school like everyone else. In high school, I took a bunch of AP classes, you know, really tried to make the the most out of my high school experience. I took a bunch of AP classes, got a bunch of college credits while I was still in high school. Definitely helped me out in the long run. I graduated high school. I ended up moving out of state going to a large four-year university to work on a bachelor's degree. My original major was actually pre-med, pre-medical sciences. Um, The university that I chose to go to, I selected it because it actually had a pre-med to med school fast track program. Um, However, some financial straits happened. I found it very difficult to continue paying for school. Um, As I said, I was a full-time student doing working on my bachelor's degree in a pre-med program and um because i was out of state i had to work like i had to live on my own had to pay my own bills had to be an adult so i was working full-time while in school full-time and i found it way too ridiculously expensive to pay for an education at a four-year university so i went after just two semesters at a four-year college i went and decided to go to a community college. And I honestly want to say that's one of the best decisions that I've ever made. So I went to a local community college. Um, of course, they didn't have you know a pre-med bachelor's degree major there. So I decided to do something that I thought was pretty similar and would still give me um, the experience, the education, and the exposure to medicine that I needed to be a competitive medical school applicant. I knew from the beginning that I wanted to be a doctor, right? I had that in my plan from my first year of being in college, uh, but I, I had to change my pathway to get there a little bit. So I ended up going to a community college, and it's a fantastic community college, um, probably one of the best. Uh, this community college is probably closer in quality to a four-year university than it is to a standard two-year community college. So I went there, and I changed my major to pre-hospital emergency medicine, which is how I got the medic part of MD Medic. So I was originally wanting to just go there, you know, knock out all of my chemistry, biology prerequisites that I needed for a pre-med and then just go and get my EMT because I thought that that would look good on the uh, medical school application. So I started working on that. I did my EMT course. I felt an absolute love with pre-hospital emergency medicine. I love being an EMT. I love the idea of going out into the streets, saving lives, practicing medicine, and being a hero every single day. So instead of going straight to medical school after I got all of my prereqs, I did the opposite. (laughs) I went to paramedic school. After EMT school, I went to paramedic school. A lot of you guys don't know actually the difference between EMT and paramedic, so I'll break that down real quick. So if you imagine a ambulance kind of like a hospital, the EMTs will be like the nurses, right? On the back of the truck, the EMTs will be like the nurses. They help the paramedics. They um, kind of carry out the paramedics' orders. They assist in patient care. They're extremely vital to the operation of emergency medical services. The paramedic is the one that's ultimately responsible for the patient. So he would be a, kind of like the doctor in this analogy, right? So paramedics, they decide what treatments are going to be done for patients. They initiate them. They uh, essentially form an impression of what's wrong with the patient, a differential diagnosis. They treat that. They kind of decide the course of clinical care for the patient, and they direct kind of how the care is going to go. 
um, and they relay that to their EMTs, and that's how that goes. So there's a significant education difference between paramedics and EMTs as well. EMTs generally go to school for you know a semester to a year. That's EMT training um, plus your prerequisites as a paramedic. Generally, at least in the state that I got my paramedic license, it was pretty much degree required to become a paramedic. Um, then you have to get a national registry paramedic certification in order to get your state license. And so I had to basically essentially go and get a two-year degree in pre-hospital emergency medicine, paramedic science, after having done my EMT training and after having done um, a bunch of prerequisite training to even get into paramedic school. So it was essentially like a four-year degree. It was a four-year degree worth of credit hours. However, I only got an associate's degree for it. So after I became an EMT, I went to paramedic school. I got my paramedic. I loved it. I worked as a paramedic for quite some time. Immediately after paramedic school, I went on to critical care paramedic school and paramedic training. I did it through Flightbridge University, which is a fantastic resource. I recommend that. Now, actually, you can get a uh, graduate degree, uh, an accredited graduate degree from Flightbridge University now that they have done a partnership with Spalding University. Um, so I went through the training with Flightbridge University, got my critical care paramedic certification, which basically allows you to become a flight medic, allows you to work in critical care transport. Um, immediately after that, I went to the College of Remote and Offshore Medicine, their online program to um, do the tactical paramedic certification course, which basically allows you to um, deploy with the SWAT teams. It licenses you as a combat and tactical and SWAT medic. Um, then after that, I went immediately on to Skills on Point, Critical Care Transport um, Training, and I did the CNPT, or the Certification in Neonatal Pediatric Critical Care Transport um, Training. I got that certification. So in just a span of a couple of years, I went and I did my initial paramedic training at the community college, got an associate's degree in that. I went and I did my critical care paramedic training my tactical paramedic training, and my uh, CNPT, the Certification Neonatal Pediatric Critical Care Transport training, all super quick. I enjoyed paramedic world. I worked in 911, in 911 service. I worked in critical care transport. I did a little bit of tactical medicine. I did uh, a little bit of the neonatal resus team. I just absolutely loved EMS. And quite frankly, got so sucked into Loving my life in EMS as a paramedic that I yeah, put off med school for a little bit. But after a while of being a paramedic, I decided to go back into the uh, aspiration of becoming a doctor. And at this point, I was kind of a non-traditional student. I mean, at this point, I was living on my own, completely working full time, had a house, had multiple cars, bills to pay for. And, you know, most significantly, I did not have a bachelor's degree. As I said, I got a bunch of credit hours from a bunch of different places, but no official bachelor's degree, which I thought would be a hindrance on getting me into med school. And I definitely say it, it made it more difficult, but I was still able to find ways around this and get into med school to become a physician. Um, and so I'm going to teach you guys exactly the way that I did what I did, because I know there's a ton of people out here who are hardworking, who might have a family who might already have lived adult life, gotten a house, gotten cars, and want to go back to become a doctor. But it's too much time, too much money to go to a four-year university, which is actually kind of BS at this point because four-year universities are pretty much indoctrination stations and not actually teaching you things that you need to know. Well, that's a whole different topic. We'll talk about that in another podcast episode. But there's a lot of people who might have a community college education or might only have access right now at the point in their life to a community college education and not a bachelor's degree who still want to go to medical school. I am going to break down to you exactly how I was able to accomplish that, okay? So here's a little bit about, of statistics about med school. Here's a little bit about the average med school applicant and how the average process is to get into medical school. So the average medical school applicant applies to 15 different schools. Yes, 15 through AMCAS, which is a horribly horrific, terrible, nightmarish, disastrous uh, application service that basically all, most American med schools, except for those in Texas and except for the DO schools, use uh, to sift through their applications. So most 
medical school applicants apply to 15 different schools, and only 41% of these students who apply to 15 different schools get accepted to even one. Yes, that sounds crazy, but it's true. It is that competitive. Out of all the people that apply to, to med schools, the average applying to 15, only 41% of them get accepted to even one. It's tough out here. So the average uh, med school matriculants GPA is between a 3.6 and a 3.8, which is ridiculously high. That's essentially a straight A student throughout all four years of undergraduate. Um, and then most medical school applicants have a 510 or greater MCAT score. Most medical schools require you to have a bachelor's degree in order to even apply, in order to even be considered as a applicant, to be offered a secondary application and then an interview if you're lucky. You generally, for most American MD schools, have to have a bachelor's degree. And within that bachelor's degree, you have to have taken you know, four levels of biology, two levels of general chemistry, two levels of organic chemistry, a physics, and sometimes a psychology and statistics course. Ridiculous. It's a lot of requirements. It's extremely difficult. It's extremely stressful. You know, the average medical school per school, that acceptance rate of all of their applications that they receive is, you know, between two to four percent. So very, very competitive, very, very difficult, but ultimately worth it in the end. So as I said before, my life was not that of the average med school applicant. You know, your average medical school applicant has a biology degree or a bachelor's degree in chemistry or maybe physics or biochem. You know, this guy's been doing nothing for the past four years of his life, but living in his mom's basement and studying while mom and dad pay his bills and take care of him. He has had no social interaction. He's probably still a virgin, probably very socially square and kind of a loser, right? This is your average medical school applicant. Obviously, that's not me because, you know, I'm handsome, sexy, strong, experienced. I'm a devastator of the ladies. But, you know, that sets me apart. But the average is not like that, right? I, because I had responsibilities, you know, I was very tied down with a house, with multiple cars, with bills to pay, living on my own, states away from family, working full-time as a paramedic. I was not your average. I was what, what we would consider a non-traditional student. Um, and that kind of put me at a disadvantage, you know, because I was working full-time while I was in school for every bit of education that I did. I always have made good grades because I'm me. You know, I'm super intelligent, as I said, handsome. <laughs> yeah, I always make good grades. I've always been super smart. School's always been easy for me. But, you know, if I have just worked a 24-hour shift and I'm tired and I'm doing online classes while on another shift the next day or I'm getting my butt kicked by 911 after 911 call, it may be a little bit difficult for me to give full effort and attention to my studies. And so I did get B's at times. You know, I was a A-B student um, because I was working so much. I definitely could have been a straight-A student, but because I was working and had other responsibilities and all this other stuff, I didn't devote as much time to my studies as the virgin kid that lived in his mom's basement and who's a social loser. You know, so I was kind of at a disadvantage in terms of that. I had a... GPA that was closer to like the 3.5 mark rather than the 3.6 or 3.8. And I had very, very average MCAT scores. So I knew that I had to work even harder on top of not having a bachelor's degree in order to get what I wanted, which was to get into an American medical school, an MD school at that, and become an emergency physician. So how did I do it? How did I beat the odds? How did I beat the statistics? Well, my boy Andrew Tate, as a saying, and he says, my unmatched perspicacity and indefatigability makes me a feared opponent in any realm of human endeavor. Here's what that means. Perspicacity is defined as the ability to pay attention, the ability to see things for what they really are, the ability to acknowledge and recognize opportunities and take them. Indefatigability, if you break it down, it is exactly what it sounds like. It is the inability to become fatigued, the inability to get tired, the inability to quit. So my unmatched perspicacity and indefatigability is what got me into medical school with all of the, the disadvantages. And because these are character traits 
that can be chosen to be had, anyone can do it. And I will stand by that. There's nothing about me that makes me different from you. I mean, besides me being as handsome and as sexy and as smart as I am, I'm just, I'm just playing, guys. There's nothing about me that makes me any different in terms of potential and what you can accomplish. So, you know, my path was more difficult because I was working full time. I lived on my own. I had bills to pay, right? I had different responsibilities and things to take care of. Unlike the, you know, average medical student or a medical school applicant, you know, I didn't still live with mom and dad who were paying all of my bills and paid for them to have the, the premium, you know, MCAT preparation course. I remember specifically for an entire year, like while I was on shift, all of my free time in between calls, I spent reading through a Princeton Review um, MCAT course book, teaching myself all the material and, you know, going on Khan Academy, taking all of the Khan Academy classes for the MCAT, literally teaching myself the MCAT material um, bit by bit on my own without having any of those like paid classes to train me for this test. Not only that, but like I didn't take organic chemistry, right? I didn't take biochem. Like I'm, you don't need to know what alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase is in order to save a patient who's not breathing or who's about to go into cardiac arrest. So like that wasn't one of the requirements for paramedic school. I mean, I had the general chem, some biology, microbiology, things like that. But a lot of the organic chem stuff, like I'm not gonna lie, that was new material. I had to teach it myself and it wasn't easy. It wasn't quick. I had to lose sleep over it, but I did it because I chose to, because I chose to be indefatigable, right? Anybody can do it. I'm telling you, anyone can do it. So I self-taught the MCAT in all of my free time while I was at work, while I was on shift. Even while I was you know, at work and working full time, I decided to take online and night classes in some of the courses that I thought that I needed for extra preparation for the MCAT. Like I remember I took a microbiology course, um, you know, and I didn't have to, I'd already gotten my degrees and everything, but I took a microbiology course through a community college simply because I want to be more prepared for the MCAT. And I knew that this would be a class that would look good if I did well on it on my uh, medical school application. So I took these courses and even courses that I might have gotten like B's in before, I retook them just to get an A. Like I did that with, with Psych 101. Um, I took the online class again to make sure that I got the best score, the best score possible to look good on the application. And I'm, as I said, I took night classes. I did online classes. My schedule was already busy. I worked 80 to 100 hours a week as it was because being broke is unacceptable. Yes, being broke is unacceptable. It's a whole other podcast in itself. But I did all of that and then added in me um, doing school and going back to school just to get what I wanted. Like the desire to get what you want. No matter the cost, no matter the obstacle, is going to take you so far. That is a hallmark of indefatigability. So, you know, I, I got every certification that I did as a paramedic. I got every certification that I could, just like I told you about, so that I can not only flex in the professional world and make myself a very hireable, very desirable candidate in any job that I wanted, but also to show, you know, medical school boards and applications that, yeah, I may not be your traditional virgin, loser, biochem major, right? But I know how to save patients. I know how to, you know, do medicine. I know how to practice medicine in terms of the emergency medicine, paramedic scope of things. And even though I am trained to do this and I've been employed in doing this for a long time, I don't want to stay stagnant. I want to learn as much as I can. I'm an avid learner and I want to be the best that I can. And by me getting all the certifications that I did, I did that you know, as a demonstration of my character. And I think that that really helped me on the medical school application process. So, you know, you may not be a paramedic, you may do be an accountant, you may be a business person, you may be an engineer, but just the fact that you wanted to go back and get more training that you didn't have to get over and over again to make yourself better will go a long way in an in application, you know, and that's things that you can mention in the interview. Um, the other thing is I got really bomb letters of recommendations from actual clinicians who I worked with every day as a paramedic who saw me save lives and do heroic stuff and just be you know the sexy hero walking through the door as a chorus of angels sings. 
saving people from the very clutches of death because I'm an indie medic. <laughs> yes. I have these great letters of recommendations from former EMT partners, from former supervisors, from people that have worked with me and, and have said, you know, this guy is a fantastic paramedic. If anybody should be a doctor, it should be him. You know, I've seen this man save lives. I've seen this man think out of the box and do things that other medics haven't been able to figure out. I've seen this man's work ethic and every single hour that he has at station, instead of just sitting and watching TV and sleeping, this man wants to learn more. This man wants to make himself better. This man's taking online classes. This man's working on other certifications. This guy is the real deal. Those very uh, flattering essays and letters of recommendations really helped me a lot. And speaking of essays, another thing that helped me to get into medical school without a bachelor's degree, with an associate's degree and a bunch of other you know, certifications that are kind of hard to place but not a bachelor's degree, another thing that helped me was my essay, You know, the, the essay that I wrote for the application process. Um, AMCAS requires you to write a really long essay, and I, I don't know what it is now with the topic of – uh, discussion the topic of your essay is now what the actual prompt is but for me it was the cliche why do you want to be a doctor how do you know that you're cut out for this and I talked about the fact that you know I had already experienced the hard parts of medicine right I've already experienced what it's like to lose patients I've already experienced what it's like what it's like to see the really traumatic bloody things to lose children to go in car accidents where you know a mother is brutally injured and or, or dead or, or has perished and you have to break the news to the children or you know just these really terrible emotional traumas I've experienced what it's like to be sleepless because you have patient after patient after patient and still have to have a strong sharp uh, compendious mental state in order to process and do your job I understand what it's like to be uh, you know backed up by 16 charts for patients that you have taken care of and you haven't had time to get to them because it's been so busy. Like I talked about all the difficult parts of that I've already experienced in the world of practicing medicine and that because I've seen the most difficult things, I know that I can do it. Because I've seen the hard parts that make people want to quit because I've been through those things already, I know that I will not be deterred by the things that make everybody else quit because I've already been through them. I spoke about my experience as a paramedic and wanting to make the world a better place for paramedics. I'm talking about how I want to become a emergency physician and an EMS medical director to make EMS a underappreciated and unrecognized career field, um, a valid, respected, well-paid uh, career. I talked about all those things, how I had a clear path, a clear purpose, and even just was honest about how I had a disadvantage compared to some of the other students who had applied to medical school because of my situation, because of having to work, and how I still pushed through it and worked harder than everyone else. And that earned their respect. That got me waitlisted at four different medical schools and accepted to two, right? That, that got me competitive with all of the students who had better grades, who had better scores, and had a bachelor's degree because I was that perspicacious and indefatigable. Another thing, you know, once you get to your primary application and your secondary, once you get in the interview, if you've worked as hard as I've worked to get into medical school and done as much as I've done, then talking to people is easy. You know, and I'm not trying to brag, but I'm an MMA fighter. I'm a paramedic. I've done all kinds of things in my life. I've accomplished a lot. I've seen a lot. I've done Tons and tons of things that most people have not even done, right? Talking to people is an easy thing. Talking to people is so easy. And I'm sure that if you are in a similar situation as I was, trying to get into medical school without a bachelor's degree, community college credits, might have gone the paramedic route, you have to work your butt off harder than other people. And so talking to people, interpersonal interaction is the easy part. And so I use that to my advantage to just blow away my interviews, to tell my story, to let my personality lead, to let my experiences lead the way. And where people were on the fence about me because of my average grades and my average scores in, in terms of in comparison to other medical school applicants, where they were on the fence about that, I absolutely crushed it and was able to really gain some points by my strong interviews and just tying it into how my clinical experience in the past um, – makes me solidified in why I want to do this going forward. So, you know, 
I will put a little caveat. It's obvious that I am black, right? It's obvious that I'm a minority. Um, I, I hate pulling the race card, man, because I, I think that no matter what color you are, I believe in a meritocracy, right? You should get exactly what you work for, exactly what you deserve, regardless of your color. I hate this whole idea of affirmative action and, you know, meet, meeting a diversity or racial quota. I absolutely hate it. And I understand that it worked in my favor. And I understand that a, a black person is four times more likely to get into medical school than a white person or an Asian with similar MCAT and GPA. Um, and I hate that. Like, honestly, I'm the kind of person, if, if a white boy worked harder than me, was more perspicacious and indefatigable than me, put more forth more work, more effort, more blood, more sweat, more tears, and performed higher than I did, he deserves a spot more than I do. And I'm going to put that up front. Like, I absolutely hate this race car thing. Uh, but I, I do understand that that did work in my favor and that if you are in the position of trying to get into medical school without a bachelor's degree and you're not a minority, that that might actually, like, you know, make it even more difficult for you. But – it's difficult in the first place for anybody who doesn't have a bachelor. So I, I think that the message and, and the things that I'm, I'm saying today, the advice that I'm giving is going to help anyone who really wants to do the same thing that I did. Uh, funny story about that. One of my friends that um, I'm in medical school with, uh, his last name, well, I'll, I'll keep him anonymous because I don't want anybody getting canceled or anybody, you know, getting any kind of negative uh, retribution for anything. But he looks as white as he can be. Like, you look at him, he looks like Conor McGregor, straight up. Like, looks like a white boy. He's half Mexican. He has a very uh, distinct Hispanic last name. But if you look at him, you wouldn't think so. This man played his minority card so hard. I mean, like, on, on purpose during the interview, spoke with a Hispanic accent. Like, definitely, like, in his essays, talked about wanting to be an advocate for the Hispanic community. This guy finessed it and ended up getting in. And he even had to, to go through, like, three different application processes to get in. I mean, it's that difficult. But he was able to make it in. So you got to do what you got to do. Um, but, you know, I'm here to tell you guys it's very possible to get into medical school with an associate's degree. Or maybe even less than that. Um, without even doing that. On the first time, which is what I did. I got into a USMD school. First time app do the application cycle without a bachelor's degree, and and this is how, um, you know, this is how I did it. I'm explaining to you in this podcast how I did it. So schools that are options for people who took a similar path that I did are schools that don't exactly require a bachelor's degree. There are a few, right? you know, there's probably a dozen or more. I'm sure there's more than the examples that I'm going to list here, but these are some of the ones that I applied to because I looked. And uh, looked at the things that they require and saw if they would actually meet the, the profile of the kind of applicant that I was, if they would actually match and be compatible with that. So there are schools that don't require bachelor's or degrees or even like course prerequisites like the, like the biochem or the organic chemistry that I didn't take. Um, there are schools that only require 90 credit hours of undergraduate work, which I had much more than that with all the things that I did. Um, so there are schools that only require 90 credit hours of undergraduate coursework, a competitive MCAT score, a solid GPA, and, and things like that. You know, good interviews, good letters of recommendation. Uh, some of these schools actually even take pride in being holistic application um, review process schools. So like these schools actually like take pride in accepting people who are non-traditional and accepting the people who are not the average nerd, loser, virgin Kim and bio major. I'm sure I'm going to get hate for this. You know, if you're one of those guys, send me hates in the comments. I'm sure you couldn't beat me up. Like, fight me, bro. <laughs> but yeah, so there's schools that actually like are geared to accepting people like, like you and I. If you're listening to this, I'm pretty sure that you're interested in the whole idea of trying to get in without a bachelor's degree. Um, there's a lot of different options that you have. Mind you, it's still going to be harder for you and for people like us, then it would be for if you had a bachelor's, but it's still possible. And I can say that because I got into two different medical schools and got waitlisted to four. You know, like that's pretty decent. 
And I told you kind of what my background and my past was. So we'll, we'll kind of go through all of these schools, um, you know, at least the ones that I know about, the ones that I applied to. Um, so the first one that we'll go through that it is an option for people who don't have a bachelor's degree, who really want to go to medical school and who have gotten the 90 credit hours of prereqs would be the University of Virginia School of Medicine. So on their website, you know, as you can see, they strongly prefer a bachelor's degree. However, the minimum requirement is 90 undergraduate credit hours. Um, and the school also does not have the prerequisite requirements. I mean, which to me makes a bunch of sense because you have to understand organic chemistry enough to pass the MCAT. And if you've done decent on the MCAT, then you've kind of already proven that you have an, a concept of organic chemistry and biochem. Um, so I, I agree with that. So even though they strongly prefer a bachelor's degree, I will say University of Virginia is one of the schools that I got waitlisted at. So it's very possible to get in. I mean, if you're a just regular person and, you know, can get a better GPA and MCAT score than what I got, I'm sure you can get in because I was right on the cusp. So um, another option would be Western Michigan University School of Medicine. So this school has the 90 credit hour minimum and they have no mention of a strong bachelor's degree preference. They don't have a required um, course prerequisite load. Um, they say that they want a minimum MCAT of 497, which is actually like below average. As I said, your average uh, medical school applicant who gets in to medical school has a 510. You know, average score is like right about 500 or so. So like if you got a 497, you could still get into Western Michigan. And their minimum GPA is 3.0, which is like very reachable, very attainable. Another school that I got waitlisted at. This school is a fantastic option for like the regular person who is not the typical straight A student who applies to medical school or like those who are like myself, like normally got straight A's throughout high school, throughout the AP courses. But because you had to work so much, because, you know, you had a family to take care of, because you had bills to pay, because whatever situation is going on in adult life as a real person, you may have not had time to study enough to be a straight A student. You might have gotten B's and stuff like this. This is still an option for you as long as you're able to check the boxes in other areas. Another school that will accept you without a bachelor's degree would be Eastern Tennessee State University, Quillen College of Medicine. It's a mouthful. But what they mention on their website is their only requirements mentioned is a minimum of 90 uh, credit hours of undergraduate coursework that demonstrates scientific proficiency. Uh, there's no minimum MCAT or GPA score that was mentioned on the website, so very much attainable. And actually, if you look into the top uh, schools in terms of easiness to get into in the United States, Eastern Tennessee usually is in the top 10. So uh, mind you, any medical school in the United States is difficult to get in, but Eastern Tennessee seems to be a little bit more achievable. Um, there's another one, the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. So I will say University of Cincinnati is definitely a REACH school. Uh, it is a competitive school with a huge track record, well-known all around. If you actually listen to the podcast, Heavy Lies the Helmet, it's a you know a flight medic podcast, fantastic for continuing education. Uh, that podcast is based out of um, UC Air Care and the UC Department of Emergency Medicine. So um, this school is like well-known for having the very first emergency medicine residency program in the United States. And although this may not be the easiest school to get into, they're very much a school that practices the like holistic application process. So like they don't have a stated MCAT score or GPA minimum requirement, but the average matriculant like who gets into UC, if you look at the metrics, they actually like are super like high scoring. So the average like like MedCat that gets into UC um, has a very high GPA, has a very high MCAT score that's like much higher than the average med school applicant. So, so this is really a reach school. This is not one that everybody can get into. Um, but if it's definitely a possibility. If you want to try, you know, I'm always a shoot for the stars kind of person. If you want to try to get into it, this is a school you can apply to. It's a fantastic school. Um, as I said, they require a minimum of 90 credit hours of undergraduate education. And it should be noted that they strongly consider applicants from non-scientific backgrounds. So, like, you can be a philosophy major and apply to UC and, and still get in. So, um, you just got to work really hard to get in a school like this. Another option would be Tulane University School of Medicine. Down in the Big Easy, right? So, this school in New Orleans 
mentions nothing on their website about requiring a bachelor's degree. They do provide a list of recommended like undergraduate courses that they want you to have taken to make sure that you understand the scientific foundations of medicine, that you're going to spend your whole first semester of medical school uh, just absolutely being tortured as you learn it. It's, it's awful. I do not recommend. That part of medical school is not fun at all. Um, but So they, they recommend that you take courses like o organic chemistry, general chemistry, physics, biology, uh, to get in, but they're not required, right? They are also um, not mentioning a minimum MCAT score or GPA needed to attend this school. So, I mean, it's it's a reachable school. Generally, if they don't mention a, in, an MCAT or GPA minimum, that basically says that they are considering the whole applicant outside of just numbers, which gives a person who has a strong character and a strong life resume a chance to shine. Another school, and this one is definitely a reach, like a very competitive school. I'm sure it's one that you all have heard of. You all have like heard of it in the news, seen it on football games, all kinds of very competitive school. But Baylor College of Medicine down in Texas. This school does not require a bachelor's degree for entrance. However, it does mention that there are many required course prerequisites that you have to take in order to get into this school. And also a thing is this school does not accept AP credits as part of your course prerequisites. Like most schools, if you took organic chemistry in high school as an AP course, they'll accept that as one of your prerequisite courses and they'll allow that to be reflected on your college transcript as college credits. However, Baylor does not allow that. They want you to have your organic chemistry, your general chemistry, your physics, your biology courses taken at an actual university. So, I mean, it's, it's a very difficult school to get into. The next one is going to be Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. So this is actually probably the most competitive school in this list. This is probably the, the reachiest of the reach, right? This is a very difficult school to get in. I applied here. I didn't even get offered a secondary application. Like, is that competitive? Um, but as I said, it's it's a top tier school. It's reachable. It's doable. I don't believe anything is impossible. I don't believe that anything is impossible. Like, I believe everything is possible for those who want it enough. So if you're willing to work super hard, you can totally get into Vanderbilt. I just had a lot going on in my life. I didn't really strive um, to get into there. I just really wanted to get into a school period. And I did. A fantastic school at that. Um, but for those who, who are interested in Vanderbilt, you can possibly get in there without a bachelor's degree. Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, um, as I said, one of the hardest on the list, if not the hardest. But they do have a very holistic process that only requires a minimum of 90 credit hours of undergraduate work. There's also no mention of a MCAT score or GPA on the website, but they do explicitly say on the website that lower GPAs and MCAT scores are very quickly eliminated from the process before they're even offered a secondary application due to the competitive nature of the school. So, I mean, tons of people have heard of Vanderbilt. It's a very popular, huge college, um, gets a lot of media attention. A lot of people want to apply to it. So unless you're top tier... Like you're probably going to get eliminated. And you have to remember, all of these schools that I'm naming, you're still competing with the more traditional, more classic applicant that has a bachelor's degree, maybe a master's degree or a you know doctorate degree in something else. So like you really have to be on the top of your game. Nothing is impossible, but you can do it. Another school on the list would be Carl Illinois College of Medicine in Champaign, Illinois. They're actually kind of based out of the Carl Foundation Hospital um, in Champaign, um, I applied to this one. I did not even get <laughs> offered a secondary year. But this school does not have a minimum GPA requirement. However, it does have a minimum MCAT score of 498, which is, as I said, very attainable. I got far above that. There is no requirement of a bachelor's degree for this school. However, they do go through your transcript, and they have, like, you know, 12 different undergraduate levels of competency that they want you to have met. And so they look at your transcript and, and basically – See if what you have taken in your undergraduate transcript, if it matches up with these 12 competencies, and you have to at least get nine of them to even be considered for a secondary application. It's pretty ridiculous. It's, it's really wild. But, um, you know, this school, what makes it interesting, what makes it set out is that it's a, it's a newer medical school. I think they've only been in operation at, for, you know, three or four years as of the creation of this video. Um, so because they're newer, you might have a chance to, you know, get in, maybe less competitive because it's still new and trying to get its name out there. And this school also 
um, takes pride in teaching medicine from the perspective of engineering. So, like, they try to teach the body more like a machine, um, which which makes sense because, you know, we're just a big meat machine. And when we break, you know, we need meat parts replaced. It's very similar. But because this is a very engineering-heavy, engineering-focused school, they very much, like, appreciate pay, um, applicants that have calculus and trigonometry and advanced mathematics as part of their undergraduate course load. So, I mean, if that's you, that's definitely an option for you, for you engineers out there. Another one is Pitt State College of Medicine. This is a school that I actually did really well in the application process with. And Penn State was one of my top choices. Um, Penn State does not explicitly require a bachelor's degree, but rather they require a form of undergraduate degree from any like American or Canadian institution. So any undergraduate degree works for them. So they'll take an associate's, they'll take a bachelor's. They don't explicitly require just a bachelor's degree. So like those of you who have an associate's and have taken some more coursework to get to the 90 credit hours or have gone the you know degree paramedic route like I did, that basically makes you where in order to get that associate's degree, you have to have taken a lot of prereqs before that. And so you're way past 90 degrees, but 90 credit hours by the time you finish it. This is a really good option for you. It is definitely a more competitive school, um, but I really like this one because they do this um, fast track for those who want to go into emergency medicine and family medicine. They do an accelerated three-year medical school plus three-year residency for both of them because there's such a shortage of ED physicians and family practice physicians and primary care. Um, they want to get you through quickly. So it, it's definitely a really cool option for you to consider. Another one is Albert Einstein College of Medicine, another way, way, way competitive school. So this is like one of the hallmarks of the holistic application process. If you read their actual website, which I have listed here on the video, um, it is a website that doesn't mention anything in the way of requirements for either courses, undergraduate degree, or minimum MCAT score, like completely holistic, considering the whole person like past experience, even talk about like how they prefer a person who comes into this medical school to have EMT or CNA experience, but they are also very, very competitive and uh, generally like they don't let you in with the low GPA period, even though they don't have a stated minimum that is a hard number. If you have a low GPA, like you probably won't get into here. They actually on their website say that generally people who make under a 3.75 GPA don't get in. So um, yeah, I applied to this school. I didn't get extended a secondary. It's a very competitive school. Um, and then the last one that I'll mention here is Lewis Katz, uh, School of Medicine at Temple University. So Temple University Medical School takes pride in its holistic application process. It does not have a bachelor's degree requirement, coursework prerequisite requirements, or minimum GPA or a minimum MCAT score listed on its website, on the admissions website. However, being a very competitive university, I mean, everyone's heard of Temple University basketball and things like that. They're, you know, one of the more mainstream American MBA schools. And because they're more competitive, you know, you, you pretty much have to have a higher GPA and MCAT score to get in, which these things are very obtainable. Like from a community college, you can get a very solid education there. You can still do well there and still stand out. Um, I, I did get extended a secondary application from uh, Temple University. So with that being said, you know, they don't list specific courses that you have to take in order to get in, but they essentially say that they want you to demonstrate competency in organic, in organic chemistry, in general chem, in biology, in physics, in psychology, things like that. But I mean, if you think about it, all these things are things that are tested on the MCAT anyway. So if you do well on that, you're pretty much demonstrated, hey, I can, I can do this. Um, so those are all of the American MD medical schools that I'm going to mention that will allow you to get in without a bachelor's degree. Mind you, I in generally wanted, wanted to stay like Midwest to East Coast area in my application process. So I didn't do too much research about schools like way out West or, you know, on the West Coast. So this is going to be kind of an overview of only like, you know, from the East Coast over to Illinois, you know. But I'm sure there's more out here, but here's a few options though that I gave you. I must also do an honorable mention to the Caribbean medical schools. I know a lot of you might laugh, but 
For some people, Caribbean medical schools might actually be a viable option. I'm not going to lie. I applied to some Caribbean medical schools, and I got into them. Um, I did them kind of as a safety net because I wasn't really sure if I was going to get into any American MD schools. Um, and some of the schools were actually pretty, like, reputable. You know, although many of the Caribbean medical schools are um, – kind of frowned upon most of them are american ran like their their headquarters and their instructors and their curriculum comes from america and you know technically if you're a graduate of one of these schools you've gotten an american md education and you can still match into an american residency program you'll just have to match to the international medical graduate or img match process which is even more competitive than the actual you know american uh, residency match process and so there is the realistic possibility that you went to four years of medical school, got a couple hundred thousand dollars in debt, and now you're leaving and not even able to match into a residency program and have a worthless degree, worthless MD after your name, that you're not even able to practice with and pay off your debt. That is a real, real like threat, and that's kind of kind of scary. Um, so I mean, but the benefit though is if you don't have that strong of uh, MCAT scores or GPA. Um, a lot of these schools, like, they don't really have as hard of a GPA cutoff. Like, some of these schools might allow you to get in with, like, a 2.5. Um, and then a lot of these schools don't even require MCAT scores. Um, I personally, like, I applied to Trinity University. That was one of them. I applied, and because I did have a, you know, decently competitive GPA and MCAT score, I literally applied and got sent an acceptance the very next day along with the scholarship. And Trinity, for example, is uh, one of the schools in the Caribbean that I would actually recommend. They have affiliates at um, Baltimore Shock Trauma Hospital and also at a hospital in Warner Robins, Georgia, where you can go and you can do your rotations in third and fourth year there. You know, you go down to the Caribbean for your first two years and then you go back to the United States to do your rotations there, which also allows you to get Letters of recommendations from American hospitals that will look good on your residency application. Um, and honestly, if you go to a Caribbean medical school that doesn't offer American like mainland rotations, it's pretty much worthless and I wouldn't go there. But I mean, there are some very, very viable options. Another benefit about a lot of like the Caribbean medical schools is that you can go and start at different dates like they might have a group that's starting in january a group that's starting in may a group that's starting in september um and so like though you may have missed the application process for the group that's that started in the previous september you can get to the january and end up finishing about the same time as the class before you to start in september and get to the same match so like you could apply and theoretically start medical school just a couple months later and be able to get done with it quicker so i mean like it, it there is benefits to it so i hope that from this podcast i gave you hope and inspiration that even though you don't have a bachelor's degree even though you might only have community college credits even though you might be working full-time have a family have bills to pay and take care of you can still get in medical school you can still get on your way of becoming a doctor you can still take the path of the md medic and achieve all of your dreams That's what we're about here, making the most of what you can do. I've never, ever said that anything worthwhile in life is easy, that anything worthwhile in life would come without any difficulty, but it's all possible if you're willing to work hard, if you're willing to put your hand to the wheel and do the grind and put in the work to get things done, if you're willing to be perspicacious and indefatigable like our friend Andrew Tate. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you become a better, stronger, more wealthy, more excellent individual. Become the alpha male. Become the person you always wanted to be. MD Medic out.